Hey guys, Mike here. So in this video, I'm going to explain to you how to do like a concrete driveway slash parking area type of slab. I'm going to go over the forming, the tying the matter rebar, the pouring, you know, giving it a broom finish. First, let's talk about the gravel underneath. I live in Maine. We have a lot of freeze and thaw cycles. So what the guys did here is it was like grass like you see in behind me. They came in and they dug out about two feet of that grass and topsoil. And then they put in this three quarter inch crushed gravel. They put in about eight inches and then they roll it and compact it. Then another eight inches, compact it. And then the last eight inches and compact it. And that's what got them to here. And this pad also slopes kind of towards the front right corner to kind of match the driveway over to the right. So it's all going to be a slope slab. Now what I'm doing is they gave me four stakes, one for each corner to match. And they put the level of the slab on each stake where they wanted me to match it to. So I'm going to screw the corners together. It's roughly like 28 by 20. A little over 500 square foot, foot pad here for a driveway or a parking area. So all they wanted me to do was screw the corners together about where the stakes are and match the level of the corners to the marks they put on those wooden stakes. And then the front has an angle here to kind of match the driveway that they're going to patch back in with asphalt after. So I got my boards all screwed together. I got the corners screwed where I wanted them. Got, kind of got the boards in place. Now I'm just running a string around. And I, and this is just to keep the boards straight while I stake them in place. I kind of like to put the string in the middle of the board. That's just the way I've always done it. You know, you can put it wherever you want it. The front of the board, the back of the board. Um... We just prefer the middle and then I'll go around and I'll use these I use these round three quarter by two foot long metal stakes they got holes already drilled through them that you can put a nail through or a screw through and these are going to hold the forms in place as I pour the concrete and they also allow me to set the forms to grade pretty easily what I like about these better than wooden stakes is you know if you pound that down in there a little ways and you hit a rock they they tend to they tend to like bounce around the rock so you don't have to pull it back out and do it again unless the rock's really big um, so it just in you know they don't splinter or crack or break or anything like that so if you're gonna do a bunch of these I would I would definitely recommend investing in a bunch of those those metal pins you can get them just about anywhere get them on Amazon you get them at Home Depot um, I buy them at a local concrete supply place we have the 18 inch ones and then we got the 24 inch ones like this and it, you know if you put them in a little little bit of an angle like I do too they they seem to tend to not want to uh, move as much and if they do hit a rock they kind of slide off the rock a little bit instead of just if you put them straight down in you tend to want to they tend to want to bounce and uh, have to move them more if you do hit a rock so I'm just setting up a self-leveling laser this is a Topcon RLH5B. I'll have it in the, a link in the description for it below. This is what I use on all my jobs. I can set slopes with this. I can, I can set a slab like this perfectly flat if I want. Now what I'm doing is I'm going off the mark the excavator left me, matching that mark, screwing that corner. And I'm going to do that with all four corners first. That'll get my corners to where I need them. And remember, I said this all slopes towards this front right corner, so... Now I'll use my, my receiver and my grade stick that has a ruler on it and I'll get the, the height of each corner. It just so happens that there was about two inches different height so if one corner, the front corner here was 18 and the back corner was 20, I would set that middle to 19 that way I get that nice even slope. So now I'm doing the same thing from the back to the front finding out what my middle is and then I'm setting that form to the middle so I have a nice even slope from back to front so um, basically it's just a matter of learning how to use a, a laser that laser just sends out a nice level beam the receiver the receiver finds the level beam and then you need some type of measuring stick on your stick to go by to give you a reference So once I got everything screwed to grade, then I can go around and I can screw all my pins to my forms and that secures the forms in place. 
Then the next thing to do is to lay out for the rebar. They wanted about an 18 inch matter rebar, 18 inch on center matter rebar. So I start about six inches from one end, from one side, and I put a bar at six inches, and then I'll measure 18 inches off from that, and I'll mark it with that orange paint you saw me using. So now I can get my bars in and get them nice and straight, make sure they don't get in there crooked, and I can lay them all out. I'll lay out this, this uh, direction first, and then I can lay out my bars in the other direction these are number four bars. They're half inch rebar and they come 20 feet long. You could use number threes if you want. Um, this, the plan on this called for number fours, so that's why we're using number fours here. And this is basically, you know, a six inch pad or slab like this with a matter rebar, 18 inches on center, using 4,000 PSI concrete is pretty, is a pretty rugged slab with, with two feet of really good compacted gravel under it. Um, I'm gonna lay out 18 inches the other way. Like I said, we live in a, in a state where we have freezing temps from about the end of November to March. And they get, you know, they'll get well below zero at times with a lot of snow. So a pad like this with, a, with the right gravel base is gonna hold up pretty well. It's, we don't usually have any trouble with them heaving, frost heaving or anything like that and cracking if the, if the base is done correctly. So I'll get my bars all set up the other way. You can see the 18 inch on centers, how nice and neat that looks. And then we'll get this bar tied together. When we tie bar like this, we use what, what's called uh, loop ties. They got these little six inch ties. They got loops on each end, metal ties. And then we'll use what's called a little yo-yo tool to kind of twist them together and hold all the seams together. And then to cut the bar, I'm just using a little four inch grinder with a metal cutting wheel on it and that was good enough I didn't have to cut a ton of bar on this one we do have a bigger quick cut saw and then we also have a re an actual rebar cutter that just snaps the rebar <laughs> but for this one I just got my little handheld one out and it was enough enough just to go slice right through that rebar and get the rest of this angle put in place the loop ties that uh, Luke and Darren are using to tie this together and then the little yo-yo tool you can also get at most hardware stores uh, definitely Home Depot I'll put a link for them down in the description too you can get them on Amazon I mean if you if you just tie in a few slabs like this then those are definitely going to be the way you want to go it might take a slab like this tie in every single connection two guys it might take I don't know, four or five minutes to do something like this. Really, it doesn't really take too long. It goes pretty fast. And then once we get it all tied together, I got what's some little metal pieces called slab bolsters. They come inch and a half or, to, or two inches tall. And then you can slide those slab bolsters right underneath the rebar to hold it up off the ground as you pour. You could use some pieces of brick too if you want and just you know break the brick in half and get it up. And you don't have to put it under every single cross member. Once you get all the cross members tied together, the, the rebar is actually pr pretty rigid. So you just space them out accordingly and you can get them up in place. So this is the next day. We ordered 4,000 PSI concrete with air entrainment. The air helps protect the concrete against freeze and thaw damage. And then water reducer and that helps with slump control so we can pour a little bit looser slump without adding water. And then I always put, I still put fiber mesh in everything I pour. The fiber, the microfiber mesh is, you know, it goes in the whole thickness of the concrete, all six inches from the bottom to the middle to the top. So it just helps with, it helps with uh, micro shrinkage cracking, it helps hold the surface together a little better. And then of course you got the rebar in there to help really hold it together if something does want to break. Darren, what Darren's doing in the middle is he's magging a wet pad. We, we put those metal stakes down in the concrete with a nail through them right at the, the height we needed the slab at. We just ran a string from top of form across to the, the other side top of form. Slid that nail in the hole where the slab grade was and then we can use that pad as a strike off pad, you know, to get our grades in the middle. We, we're using a 14 foot magnesium screed here too. 
those are really really lightweight and if you if you're pouring concrete every day you're not going to want to use a 2x4 or 2x6, at least not in my opinion. Those are kind of heavy. And these come in all different lengths. Now you can see how they're screeding. Screeding is basically levels the concrete to the height you want it at. Even if it's got a slope, um, the concrete's not really going to run and sag as long as you don't pour it too wet. So that slopes from right over there where uh, Darren is in the black sweatshirt to over there over here where Luke is in the, on the left probably at least an inch in those 14 feet it might have even been an inch and a half had this had quite a bit of slope from the back corner to the front corner you want to make sure after everything's all said and done everything's graded off you know the driveways patched in that there's no puddles on this and water sheds off it when it rains so then we'll get it screeded, get the second trucks right up here. Now you can't see it, but it's right in the front mixing up. Um, and I'm gonna just get it bow floated nice and smooth. The key with bow floating is to get it nice and smooth to make your finishing process a little easier, especially if you're gonna finish it by hand and then run a broom across it. You know, you want the bow float to fill in any uh, rock holes, any, any rough aggregate left by the screeding process you want a really nice smooth surface to finish so when I when I bow float like that I go back and forth nice and even not too fast but not too slow make sure everything's filled in really really good we're also trying as we're pouring like this we're trying not to step on the rebar if we can um, obviously a little, you do here and there a little bit but trying to keep the rebar up off the bottom of the bottom of the slab get it up off the dirt so that's definitely why it, those slab bolsters work really nice now I had the, the form bowed out on me a little bit maybe a quarter inch that's why you put the string on there so I just wanted to straighten it back out and basically we use what's called a kicker drive another pin in put a little two by four brace there and just kick it back in same here with the front I probably should have put a few more metal stakes in there and I wouldn't have had to use these kickers but these were the only three spots in the slab that we had to do this on now Darren's magging that pad again we had two of those metal stakes in there and this he's matching the nail height and once he gets it matched he can pull that stake right out and we're done with that we also could, we could have left the laser up and just shot these pads with a laser too, but we just figured, you know, sometimes we'll put these metal stakes in, sometimes we'll use the laser. Either one, either way works really good. Luke and I and Darren now are just magging our edges. We prefer to mag them, just it, it makes them nice and smooth and neat. For us, it just helps us with the screeding, makes screeding go a little bit faster. Um, you definitely don't have to if you don't want to, but you can see how nice and neat those edges look now, how smooth they are. We've all been doing this a really, really long time. I've been, I've been doing concrete since I was 15, and I'm 57 right now as of this video. So about 42 years. Darren on the left, the guy in the black sweatshirt's been doing it. He's been working for me for 27 years. And Luke, the guy raking, he's been doing it about 20 years. And all, all together, we've all worked together. So it just, you know, when you get a bunch of guys that are really experienced like that that do they don't care what they do as long as the slab gets done <laughs> it makes pouring slabs like this actually pretty easy pretty fun no one's hollering and screaming we're just talking about you know everyday life things what's going on just getting our job done we like we also when we screed like this a lot of guys will screed just with one guy on the screed um, we only do that if the screed is really like six, five, four, five, six, or eight feet. Anything bigger than eight feet, ten and up, we usually have two guys on it like this. We just find that makes screeding a heck of a lot easier, especially when you screed the amount of concrete we screed in a week. You know, just having two guys on it just just makes the process go a little bit easier, a little less harder on the back and the knees and bending over. Now we just got a little bit of one little squirt left in there of concrete. We don't want to have to shovel out any if we don't need to. 
And then uh, them guys will finish screeding that up. I'm going to get it bull floated. You can tell when, when the screeding's good, when you run the bull float over it like that and there's no like dips under it, nothing you got to fill in. Both edges, the right and the left edge, are touching. That means there's no hump in there, but definitely no dips. I see a lot of guys screed and then they go to bull float and they have to stop shoveling, you know, throw some shovelfuls of concrete in there under the bull float to to fill in the the dips they have when they're screeding. And I don't know, just uh, we don't we've never really had to do that. That's what it should look like after you're screeding and you're bull floating. You shouldn't have to fill anything in if you if you're doing the screeding right. Um, I can see if you're brand new, maybe, you know, you might have a little bit of a, a learning curve there. But if you if you do this every day, that's that should be how it looks like when you bull float after you get done screed nice and smooth. So we'll wait a little bit. You know, we'll get the tools washed up. We'll get them back on the truck. We'll wait a few minutes for the concrete to firm up. And then we'll just put our edge on. You can use any type of edger, really. All we're trying to do here is we, we like these brass ones. Uh, all we're really trying to do is round the edge a little bit just to strengthen the edge so when we strip the forms off when the slab's all done they go to backfill they don't have a square edge that might chip and break really really easy and then a lot of times on broom finish stuff whether it doesn't matter what we're doing for a broom finish could be a patio could be a pool deck walkway a sidewalk um, doesn't really matter on in this case it's a driveway type thing after we broom it we might come back and leave that that edge mark just as a f like a finishing thing for more for aesthetics than anything else kind of picture frames the whole thing so basically finishing comes down to timing and you know you don't want to get on it too late but you definitely can't get on it too early or you're going to be especially with skids like this you're going to be sinking in and leaving big groove marks that you got to fill in so the timing part is really critical i go over all that in my training uh, the Concrete Underground Training Academy. So if you, if you guys want to learn a lot about timing and finishing, you can check that out below. But basically it's just a matter of getting on it at the right time, getting the surface worked up, smoothing out any little imperfections left by the bull float, and working up some nice fine paste that you can get a nice broom finish on. And if you broom finish this too early, you're going to get, you're going to roll some aggregate in it. And that's going to look like, that's really not going to look good rolling. You don't want to see any rocks or anything like that. You want to see just a nice fine broom finish on something like this. So, I mean, I'm not sinking in at all with those skids. They're sliding right along the surface without sinking in. But the surface is still moist enough to get a good, a good uh, mag float on it, a good smooth mag float. You could, I guess, you could run a Fresno over this. A Fresno is like a smooth steel trowel bull float almost and that would smooth that out too we typically don't steel trowel anything that's exterior here in maine a lot of times when you pull with air entrainment um, you don't want to really close the surface up too tight with a steel trowel because it might trap some air in there or even trap some moisture and that's going to lead to a blister or peeling later on if you mag float like this, the mag still leaves the surface open enough so that surface can breathe and it doesn't trap air under there. You definitely don't want to mag in any bleed water. A lot of times concrete will get a little bleed water on it too as it's setting up. So you got to wait for that bleed water to dissipate or you got to get rid of it with a squeegee or something. But uh, if you're down south, you don't have freeze and thaw cycles like us. Like you could mag float this, you could leave it a few more minutes, and you could steel trowel it if you want a really fine broom finish, something a little bit smoother with, with the broom. But up here, well, we have a lot of those. We don't we don't do steel troweling up here on exterior stuff. We'll mag it. We'll you know we'll wait till it's firm enough. You can see where Darren right there on the right is magging it, and Luke on the left. They they can get a pretty smooth surface just with a mag float if you do it at the right time. You watch it. Darren's got a little bit of a dip there he's filling. So he's scraping up a little paste and he's filling that dip. I probably left it with the bowl float. Just a tiny one. It might be like a sixteenth of an inch. And he needs a little more cream. He'll fill that in. Just scrape it up, fill that dip in, and then, you know, there'll be no puddle there when, when it rains. So them guys are going to go grab the broom. I'm going to finish magging. Now, if this was really hot and out in the sun, there might be a couple of us on here mag floating this out and just one guy brooming. But where it's a little bit cooler today and it's, there's no sun out, it's kind of cloudy, 
I could keep up with it pretty good just myself. And then them guys, they got a three foot concrete broom. They're just going to drag it backwards. You could push it and then pull it backwards too if you need to. We Most of the time we just like to drag it like this backwards and it seems if you mag it at the right time and then broom it at the right time, it seems to leave a really nice fine broom finish. Um, we, like again, you don't want, if you see rocks rolling, if you see the aggregate in the surface as you're brooming it, then you know you're too early. You just got to stop, wait a few minutes, mag it out again. But if you're just seeing the broom, the broom marks in the surface paste, then you know you got it at the right time. And that's a little bit of a learning curve too. If you're just starting out, I teach all that. Like again, I teach all that in the training guys. If you don't, you know, if you're not working with somebody every day, kind of like us on a crew, and them guys aren't teaching you what you need to know, then it's it, it can be hard to learn. You know, if you're trying to learn some of this stuff, we when you know when people come work with us, we want to teach them everything. I figure that the more people know about finishing, the easier it is for our job. So everybody knows what to do. Then there's no there's nobody standing around watching everybody just grabs a tool and does their job and we get it done that much easier that much faster um, there's no egos there's no egos here on our crew I like teaching everybody everything and obviously the more you know the more valuable you are to the person you're working for so it's definitely worth it to have a person of value there and not just somebody that's gonna run and get tools for you They make all different widths of those brooms too. We got two footers, we got three footers, we got four footers. We we tend like if we're brooming just one guy by ourselves, we tend to like the two footer a little bit better because it's lighter. If we can get a couple guys, you know, helping out with the broom on something big like this, then we can go up in size a little bit with the broom. And then they also make the different bristles. These are like a medium bristle broom. So you're going to get like a medium texture depending on how firm the concrete is. And then they also make like horse hair type brooms or even a mixture of horse hair. And um, there's, there's, there's a couple different mixtures. I'll have them down in the, in the description. But this, so you can, you can do a really fine, fine broom finish with like a, a little bit finer type horse hair broom. Yeah, I'm getting my I'm getting my job almost done. <laughs> who down who who down there would want my job versus the job Darren and Luca doing? Let me know in the comments. <laughs> I don't mind magging and I I need the exercise anyway. It helps keep me young. I like using those two different size mags too. I got that one's a little bit longer than the other. The longer one I I typically call a Darby, but it's probably 24 inches, and then the shorter one's 16 inches. They both work good though. Darren also, you know, you if you run, if you don't clean the broom off like every pass or every other pass, sometimes the paste will build up in the bristles. And what happens is as as the paste builds up in the bristles, some of it starts to roll off under the broom as you're dragging it across and it leaves these little like concrete bumps or concrete snotties if you want to call them all over the surface and that that just looks like crap to me I mean you they will knock off the next day if you take like a little scraper and knock them off or even your mag float and kind of use the edge of your mag and kind of they will knock off but they it does kind of make it look like crap remember first impressions are everything so if the person you're working for shows up and sees all those little concrete snotties on there and they're like what the heck is that a first impression really means everything so you really want it to look nice from the get-go and this concrete seemed just a little sticky so that's why these guys are just bumping it off after each pass and basically that means just you know run it across top of that bucket you can see a little bit of the paste on top of that bucket you, they could dip it in the bucket that bucket's full of water and they could rinse those bristles off too if they need if thought, thought they needed to but just running it across the surface gets the, the excess paste off it and then I'm in back there you can see me with the edger I'm just following behind 
retouching up the edge, re-rounding it, making sure that looks nice and neat. And then that's, we're going to leave it like that. We're going to leave that edge mark in there. You'll see it a little bit better here in a minute as we do the front. And Darren's working on this this angle up here now. So we're going to remove those forearms, remove the stakes and the kickers. The excavator will come back in. He'll cut out some of that cracked up driveway. And then he'll pave right up to the top. So they can. there'll be a smooth transition from driving from the asphalt right up to the top of this, this parking slab. That's one reason to pound your stakes down below top of form too. So when you're dragging the broom over it. The broom doesn't hit the top of the, the metal pins, but when I drove them in there, the, the gravel was pretty hard, so I just drove, drove them in so it, they were nice and tight. They now Darren's down to a broom that he can handle by himself pretty easy, and Luke's gonna come back and help me do finish up the edging. So we'll end up, the, like we'll come back the next day, we'll strip the forms off, we'll saw cut down the middle each way for contraction joints, and that'll help control hopefully help control any shrinkage cracking. If it does want to crack, then that rebar is in there to hold it all together nice and tight. And then uh, that's that's what will happen the very next morning. We could cut grooves in by hand too. I mean, the trouble with cutting grooves in by hand in Maine is sometimes the water will get in there in the winter and it will expand, freeze, expand and contract, and it just leads to a little bit more uh, scaling healing problem so we typically like to saw everything up here but that's how we finish pour finish a concrete pad in Maine guys uh, thanks for watching we'll see you on the next one